Christian died Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ in vain He suffered by his death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints That history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman Pope ruled the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say by the same faith we live today. Good evening. Welcome to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be hosting for the next two hours. We'll continue our reading and discussion of this most pro, uh, the, the, this most uh, important Protestant work entitled Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness. And then we'll have, after an hour of reading, we will have one hour of discussion. And we'll get right to the book. We ended on page 191 last time, but we're going to retreat to page 188. What we're going to be reviewing tonight is some of the most important information in this book. We're talking about what the early Christian believers believed and taught. Those Christians who lived just after the apostolic times, the earliest Christians, what did they believe about futurism and historicism? Henry Grattan Guinness is going to show us what they believe by, re, by citing their works and quoting from their works that are still extant. These works of the early apostolic fathers are still available to be read, and we're going to cite their works. Were they futurists, as Rome would have us believe, or were they historicists? First of all, I'm going to tell you that the early church fathers, as they are called, believed the prophecies of Daniel were fulfilled in their time. The, the, the four beasts, the, the, the lion the bear, the leopard, and then the terrible beast represented first Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, and finally Rome. And they acknowledged that Daniel was absolutely correct. Why? Because they saw the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecies in history. So they were historicists, weren't they? They weren't looking for a future fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. They looked back in history for the fulfillment of that prophecy, and they were assured that Daniel was absolutely correct because at the time of the writing of their works, these early church fathers, immediately after the apostolic times, the earliest Christians were historicists. And true Bible-believing Christians to this day are historicists. Now, Rome 
wants us all to believe that the early church fathers were futurists. Why? Because that if they can make us all believe that they were looking for Antichrist to come within the last seven years of time, well, that exonerates the papacy as even a possibility for the Antichrist, right? That's why Rome wants us to believe in futurism. And most of the Christian world today does believe in futurism. They have exonerated the papacy. They have repudiated the belief of every Christian prior to about two or three generations ago. All the way back to apostolic times, they believed the historic interpretation of the prophecies. And they were sure of their beliefs. They'd already been fulfilled in history. To talk about futurism to any one of these early church fathers would, to be, would be laughable. They would laugh you to scorn. And then they would restore your historic belief in the scriptures and the historic understanding and the interpretation of the prophecies. Now, with that preface, we'll continue on page 188, about midway down the page. Henry Grattan Guinness says, we shall find, on the other hand, as we study the subject, that the historic interpretation of prophecy, the interpretation which condemns Rome, and which Rome consequently condemns, grew up gradually with the progress of events and the development of the apostasy of Latin Christianity that it slowly modified its details under the illuminating influence of actual facts, but that it retained its principles unaltered from age to age, that it was defended by a multitude of earnest students and faithful expositors, and that it shaped the history of heroic struggles and of glorious revivals of spiritual life and testimony. Now, I want to comment about one portion of this, of, of this w- that we've just read. The early church fathers were historicists. They grew up believing that it was the Roman Empire or that which s- immediately succeeded the Roman Empire would be the, the rule of Antichrist, but that it would be Rome in character because there were only four beasts, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, and the Roman. So they knew that the current power that was in place at the time, that of the pagan Roman Empire, ruled by the Caesars, would be replaced by the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn that speaks blasphemies and kills God's people. But it would still be Roman because there's no fifth empire mentioned by Daniel. For those who are of the opinion that the Antichrist is going to be a Muslim, you have departed from the Scripture. You have departed from prophecy. You have called Daniel a liar. The Antichrist and the great apostasy predicted in the Scripture is Roman because there's not a fifth empire for a different Antichrist, for a different man of sin. It's got to be Roman. Okay, This is where we make the great mistake, the grand delusion, the great delusion, which is that the Pope is not the Antichrist, as all Christians believed through history, But he's the vicar of Christ, the representative, the the chief spiritual ruler of all Christianity. That's embodied in the current ecumenical movement. That's what it's all about, to restore the papacy to his global supremacy, that which he lost at the Protestant Reformation. All right, he says, we shall find, on the other hand, as we study the subject, that the historic interpretation of the prophecy the interpretation which condemns Rome and which Rome consequently condemns grew up gradually with the progress of events and the development of the apostasy of Latin Christianity. All right, they saw the great apostasy that was, a, that was predicted in the prophecy to spring up 
from Latin or Roman Christianity. That is the great falling away. That they would simply take the pagan Roman Empire, replace the Caesars with the Pope, and call it the Christian Roman Empire or the Holy Roman Empire. And they acknowledged that this Latin Christianity, this Roman Christianity, was the great apostasy. Naturally, you would expect that if the Caesars were replaced by another Roman who was occupying the same pagan empire, that that great apostasy would grow up within the Roman uh, replacement of the Caesars. So it makes good sense. It makes scriptural sense. It makes prophetic sense. Okay? He says that it slowly modified its details under the illuminating influence of actual facts, but that it retains its principles unaltered from age to age. Has it not maintained its principles from age to age? Here we are 2,000 years later that it was defended by a multitude of earnest students and faithful expositors and that it shaped the history of heroic struggles and of glorious revivals of spiritual life and testimony. This is the interpretation whose history during 15 centuries we propose to review this evening. I want to reiterate the information that we are about to talk about here in this book are going to cover 15 centuries of Christian history. We're not going to talk about the supposed seven years of great tribulation that's supposed to take place at the end of time, as Rome suggests, and wants us all to believe. But we're going to talk about the prophecies of Daniel, Paul, and John that cover the entire history of Christianity. Okay? He says, this interpretation whose history during 15 centuries we propose to review this evening. We shall divide these 15 centuries into three periods, okay? Don't forget, we're going to be talking about 1,500 years, and we're going to break that 1,500 years into three specific periods. Number one, the period extending from apostolic times, the times of the apostles, to the fall of the pagan Roman Empire in the 5th century. In the 5th century, the Caesars left Rome, went to Constantinople, left a power vacuum in Rome, and the papacy stood up in its place. The man of sin, the little horn of Daniel, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist rose up in the 5th century, right after the restrainer, was taken out of the way, just as Daniel predicted. Number two, the period extending from the fall of the pagan Roman Empire to the rise of the papacy in the 5th century to its exaltation under the pontificate of Pope, or rather Antichrist, Gregory VII, whose name was Hildebrand, the founder of the papal theocracy in the 11th century. Okay? Okay. So first, from apostolic times until the end of the pagan Roman Empire and the beginning of the papacy. Then we're going to talk about the period from the rise of the papacy to the pinnacle of its power under Antichrist Gregory VII in the 11th century. And third, the final period, the period from Antichrist Gregory VII to the Protestant Reformation. All right, he says, first, then, let us glance at the history of prophetic interpretation in the interval extending from the apostolic times to the fall of the Roman Empire in the 5th century. This is period number one. We're going to talk about it. This was the period of the so-called fathers of the Christian church. A multitude of their writings remain to us containing not only almost countless references to the prophecies in question, but complete commentaries on the books of Daniel and the Apocalypse. It is boldly claimed by many that these early church fathers of the first five centuries held the 
futurist interpretation of these books. We deny the correctness of this position and assert that the the early Christian fathers of the first five centuries belong to the historical school of interpretation. How do we know this? Because they'd already written down in their works that they believed Daniel was correct in that Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, predicted by Daniel, had already been fulfilled in their time. They look back in history for the interpretation of Daniel's prophecy, didn't they? Now, who's to say, who's to say with any authority that those who interpreted Daniel's prophecy in a historical sense would all of a sudden become futurist in their understanding of that prophecy? It's ridiculous, it's absurd, and it is not the truth. It defies common sense. They'd seen the fall of the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, and they were about to see the fall of the pagan Roman Empire. They were anticipating the fall of the pagan Roman Empire and the rise of the Antichrist. Who in their right mind would suggest or dare to suggest that the early church fathers were futurists in their interpretation of the prophecies? He says, we deny the correctness of this position and assert that the early church fathers of the first five centuries belonged to the historical school of interpretation. Now, it was impossible for them, owing to the early position which they occupied, right after the crucifixion of Christ, right after apostolic times, rightly to anticipate the manner and the scale of the fulfillment of these wondrous prophecies, but as far as their circumstances permitted, they correctly grasped their general significance and adhered to the interpretation which regards prophecy as foretelling the whole course of the church warfare from the first century to the second advent of Christ. Let me repeat, they understood the prophecies of Daniel and Paul and John to represent the entire history of the church from the earliest apostolic times until the return of Christ. They did not believe what is believed in the churches today, that the prophecies refer to a seven-year period of time just before Christ's return. I mean, listen, common sense dictates that if God is going to tell the story about his church, he's going to tell about all 15 centuries, isn't he? Why would the prophecies all, why would 1,500 years of, just absolutely slip God's mind and he would focus all the prophecies on seven years of time? It doesn't make sense, but that's, that's what the Roman Catholic Church expects you to believe, and that's what your ecumenical Evangelii Belli churches expect you to believe. But that is not what the early church fathers, the post-apostolic fathers believed, nor is it what the Waldenses believed, or the Huguenots, or the Hussites, or any of the, pro- the Protestant, the true believers of history believed. Neither did the Protestants believe this. It's untenable. It's ridiculous to suggest that God simply skipped over 1,500 years of, church, of the church period and focus all the attention on seven years prior to his return. But that's exactly what all the churches expect us to believe. And for the most part, and I'm I'm confessing right now, for most of my life, that's what I did believe. But God's opened my eyes, and he can open yours too. Now, Henry Gretton Guinness continues, he says, it's impossible at this time to do more than present a brief summary of the views of the fathers on this subject and to name and refer you to their works. He's going to refer you to their works. You can read them for yourself. They're still available. They're extant. They're quoted from, and we're going to quote from them right here in this work. Number one, the post-apostolic fathers interpreted the four wild beasts of prophecy as representing the four empires, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. There's your historic view. 
the post apostolic the, the 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 believers who wrote and commented on the prophecies of Daniel understood that they had been fulfilled in history. Medo, Babylon had fallen, Medo Persia had fallen, Greece had fallen, and Rome was currently reigning. And they lauded Daniel. He knew exactly what he was talking about. His prophecy was fulfilled in history. There was no doubt about the accuracy of Daniel's prophecy in their mind. Now here we have the foundation of the historical interpretation of prophecy. Take as an instance the words of Hippolytus, one of the early post-apostolic fathers who wrote about the prophecies of Daniel. He says, take for instance the words of Hippolytus on the great image of the four wild beasts of Daniel. Quote, the golden head of the image, he says, is identical with the lioness by which the Babylonians were represented. The shoulders and the arms of silver are the same with the bear by which the Medo-Persians are meant. The belly and the thighs of brass are the leopard by which the Greeks who ruled after Alexander, uh, from Alexander onwards were intended. And then the legs of iron are the dreadful and terrible beast by which the Romans, who hold the empire now, are meant. The toes of clay and iron are the ten horns which are to be. The one other little horn springing up in their midst is the Antichrist. The stone that smites the image and breaks it in pieces and that fills the whole earth is Christ who comes from heaven and brings judgment on the world. Unquote. Hippolytus, volume 1, page 447. There's your post-apostolic fathers. Do you see any futurism in his beliefs? Only historicism. Guinness continues. He says, Hippolytus says in the treatise on Christ and Antichrist, Quote, Rejoice, blessed Daniel, thou hast not been in error. All these things have come to pass. Unquote. Page 19 of his work. Quoting again, he says, Already the, the iron rules. Already it subdues and breaks all in pieces. Already it brings all the unwilling into subjection. Already we see these things ourselves. We glorify God being instructed by thee, unquote, meaning Daniel. That's page 20 of his work. Number two, the fathers held that the ten-horned beasts of Daniel and John are the same. Daniel and John spoke of the same Roman beast, the fourth and final beast upon the earth. It says, as an instance, Irenaeus in his book, Against Heresies, chapter 26, says, quote, John, in the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, teaches us that the ten horns shall be which were seen by Daniel, unquote. So John simply fills in some details that Daniel leaves off but they're talking about the same thing. Rome. They're talking about Rome. There's only four beasts in the vision. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. There's not a fifth. Don't look for a fifth. Don't suggest that it's anybody but Rome that rules this world. And it's going to rule this world until Christ returns. And if you believe anything else, you have departed from the Scriptures. You have called Daniel and Paul and John liars. You are outside. We know that Daniel and John were speaking of the same beast, the iron beast. And the early church fathers confirmed that they were both right. Rome is already ruling. Rome is already subduing and breaking in pieces. He's already sub, uh, bringing into subjection God's people. He's already persecuting the saints. He is filling the pro- fulfilling the prophecies. They knew that on the basis of the historical view that Daniel's prophecies were fulfilled in history. 
Babylon had fallen, Medo-Persia had fallen, Greece had fallen, Rome was then in power, and whatever replaced the Caesars that was currently in Rome would be that man of sin, the son of perdition. Now, number two, the early church fathers held that the ten-horned beast of Daniel and John are the same. As an instance, Irenaeus, in his book entitled Against Heresies, chapter 26, says, quote, John, in the Apocalypse, that is the book of Revelation, teaches us what the ten horns shall be which were seen by Daniel, unquote, confirming that Daniel and John were talking about the same thing. Number three, the fathers held the historic interpretation of the book of Revelation. Now, as Eliot says in his magnificent tome entitled Horae Apocalypticae, volume 4, page 299, 299 in the fourth edition, he says this, none of the fathers, quote, entertained the idea of the apocalyptic prophecy overleaping, overleaping the chronological interval were it less or greater antecedent to the consummation. In other words, it's ridiculous to assume that the prophecies skip over the entire church age of 15 centuries and focuses on one little period of time at the end, which is believed by all the futurist churches, the Roman Catholic Church and all of her harlot daughters. Eliot says, none of the fathers, quote, entertained the idea of the apocalyptic prophecy overleaping the chronological interval were it less or greater antecedent or prior to the consummation and plunging at once into the times of the consummation. That is the time of Christ's return, unquote. None of the church fathers believed that the prophecies dealt only with the immediate times before Christ's return and simply skipped over the entire church history. None of the early church fathers believed that. You can conclude only one thing about it. None of the early church fathers were futurists. They believed the prophecies told the truth of the Christian age from apostolic times all the way until Christ's return. There's no futurism in that. It's all historicism, isn't it? Now here, for example, is the commentary of Victorinus on the, on the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation of John, written toward the end of the third century. Okay, Victorinus is going to comment on John's prophecy. This is the earliest commentary extant still available on the apocalypse as a whole. In this, the going forth of the white horse under the first seal is interpreted of the victories of the gospel in the first century. This view, you will observe, involves the historical interpretation of the entire book of Revelation. Okay? The historical interpretation. There's no futurism in that, is there? Victor Rhinus interprets the woman clothed with the sun, having the moon under her feet and wearing the crown of 12 stars on her head and travailing in pains to give birth as, quote, the ancient church fathers, prophets, saints, and apostles, unquote. In other words, the Judeo-Christian body of saints. He could not, of course, point to fulfillments which were at his early date still future, but he recognized the principle, the historic principle. Point number four, the early church fathers held <clears throat> that the little horn of Daniel, the man of sin foretold by the Apostle Paul, and the revived head of the Roman Empire predicted by John, represented one and the same power. And they held that power to be the Antichrist. Okay? What did the early church fathers believe? 
that the Antichrist was Roman, okay, that the Antichrist would supplant or replace the pagan Roman Caesars. Now he continues, he says, for example, Origen, in his famous work against Celsus, thus expresses himself in Book 6, Chapter 46, after quoting nearly a, the whole of Paul's prophecy about the man of sin in Second Thessalonians, which he interprets of the Antichrist, he says, quote, since Celsus rejects the statements concerning Antichrist, as it is termed, having neither read it, having having neither read what it says of him in the book of Daniel, nor in the writings of Paul, nor what the Savior in the Gospels has predicted about his coming, we must make a few remarks on this subject. Paul speaks of him who is called Antichrist, describing, though with a certain reserve, both the manner the time, and the cause of his coming. The prophecy also regarding Antichrist is stated in the book of Daniel and is fitted to make an intelligent and candid reader admire the words as truly divine and prophetic, for in them are mentioned the things relating to the coming kingdom, beginning with the times of Daniel and continuing to the destruction of the world, unquote. So, the prophecies are concerning the entire history of the church. From apostolic times, or rather even in Daniel's case, from the times of Nebuchadnezzar and the old Babylonian Empire, remember Daniel was under the Babylonian captivity, Daniel predicts all the way to the coming of Christ. The entire church history. Now Jerome, another one of the early church fathers, in his commentary on the book of Daniel, see chapter 7, says, with reference to the little horn which has a mouth speaking great things, that, quote, it is the man of sin, the son of perdition, who dares to sit in the temple of God, making himself as God, unquote. Now, I want to remind you, that the papacy is the one that rose up in the power vacuum after the Caesars went to Constantinople, and from since that time they have they have claimed themselves to be the vicars of Christ, sitting in that golden laden temple in Rome. They call it Saint Peter's Basilica, wearing his triple crown, claiming himself to. Okay, again, Jerome, in his commentary on the book of Daniel, chapter 7, says, with reference to the little horn, which has a mouth speaking great things, that, quote, it is the man of sin, the son of perdition, who dares to sit in the temple of God, making himself as God. He's describing the Pope, okay? And Jerome knew that this little horn speaking great things was also the man of sin, and the son of perdition. They're one and the same. It's the papacy. Okay? <clears throat> Number five. The early church fathers held that the Roman Empire was the quote-unquote let, L-E-T, or hindrance referred to by the Apostle Paul in Second Thessalonians, which kept back or restrained the manifestation of the Antichrist, the man of sin, the little horn, the son of perdition, the Pope of Rome, okay? It was the Roman pagan Caesars of the pagan Roman Empire that, we, that restrained the rise of the Antichrist, the rise of the papacy. Henry Grattan Guinness tells us this point is of great importance. This point is of great importance. Who replaced the pagan Roman Caesars but the popes of Rome? Who was the restrainer then? It was the Roman Caesars that was restraining the rise of Antichrist. Listen, the Caesars would not be challenged by anyone calling himself the pope. Okay? This prophecy could not be fulfilled 
until the Caesars were taken out of the way. Then the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical historical antichrist of the Bible came forth. He's the Pope. He could not have come up during the reign of the Caesars. The the Caesars would have seen the Pope as a threat to their jurisdiction, a threat to their power, a threat to their empire. It was only after the restrainer, the Roman Empire, the Caesars who controlled the Roman Empire were taken out of the way so that the Pope could rise to power. This is of great importance. Now, Paul distinctly tells us that he knew and that the Thessalonians knew what that hindrance was, what that restrainer was, what that let was, and that it was then in existence. So what was in existence at the time of Paul and the Thessalonians' time? The pagan Roman Caesars. Now, the early church, through the writings of the early church fathers, tells us what it knew upon the subject, and with remarkable unanimity affirms that this let or this hindrance, this restrainer, was the Roman Empire as governed by the Caesars. That while the Caesars held imperial power, it was impossible for the predicted Antichrist to arise, and that on the fall of the Caesars, he would arise. Here we have a point on which Paul affirms the existence of knowledge in the Christian church. The early church knew, he says, what this hindrance was. The early church Christians knew that that hindrance was the Caesars, then in power. And as soon as those Caesars were somehow taken out of the way, that man of sin would be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, the early church tells us what it did know upon this subject, and no one in these days can be in a position to contradict its testimony as to what Paul had, by word of mouth only, told these Thessalonians. It is a point on which ancient tradition alone can have, ancient tradition alone can have any authority. Modern speculation is positively impertinent on such a subject. Now, the author gives us a note here. This is some of the most important information that you'll ever hear in this book. I want you to pay particular attention to the note that the author gives us now. It goes this way. As to the quote-unquote let or hindrance, the restrainer, to the manifestation of the quote-unquote man of sin referred to in 2 Thessalonians 2, Mr. Elliot, in his work, Horae Apocalyptica, quote, we have the consenting testimony of the early fathers from Irenaeus, the disciple of... Okay, again, we will start at the beginning with this note, this most important note that Henry Grattan Dennis gives us in this book, citing uh, the, 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 the voluminous work entitled Horae Apocalyptica, He says, as to the let or the hindrance to the manifestation of the man of sin uh, referred to in 2 Thessalonians 2, Mr. Elliot says, quote, we have the consenting testimony of the early fathers from Irenaeus, the disciple of the disciple of St. John the prophet, down to Chrysostom and Jerome, to the effect that it was understood, it was understood by them all to be speaking of the imperial power ruling and residing in Rome, unquote. Horae Apocalyptica, volume 3, page 92. So the consensus was clearly that it was the Caesars of the pagan Roman Empire that were the restrainers, the let, the hindrance to the rise of Antichrist. That's what the early church fathers believed. That's what Paul believed. Paul said, don't you remember when I was with you, I told you these things? When Paul was with his people face to face, and there were no Romans in the room, he told them flat out, it's the Caesars. When the Caesars are taken out of the way, then the man of sin will be revealed. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to be soon. And when you see the Caesars, 
the restrainer taken out of the way, however it happens, look carefully at who replaces him. It's going to be the one Daniel spoke of, the one I am speaking of, the Antichrist, and the one the apostle and prophet John is speaking of, that man of sin, the son of perdition. The restrainer was the Caesars. You'll never hear this in the churches today. That's not what they teach. But it's what all Christians have believed from apostolic times to the present. All true Bible-believing Christians have believed in the historicist interpretation of the Scriptures and that the prophecies deal with the entire, the entirety of church history. And these prophecies were fulfilled in Paul and John's day. No mystery. There's no mystery. The only mystery is why anybody calling themselves a Christian today believes in futurism, that Antichrist hasn't come yet, that he comes in the last seven years before Christ's return, and that the Pope must be a man of God. That's the most unlikely scenario, but it has become orthodoxy in the churches today. The whole world wanders after the beast. It's a hideous reality. Now, continuing, he says, Irenaeus, another one of the church fathers, held that the division of the Roman Empire into ten kingdoms would immediately precede the manifestation of Antichrist. So the pagan Roman Empire was going to break up after the restrainer was taken out of the way, the Caesars were taken out of the way, and the, the Roman Empire would break up into ten kingdoms. Now, in his work, Against Heresies, Book 5, Chapter 30, he says, quote, Let them await in the first place the division of the kingdom, that is, the division of the pagan Roman Empire, into ten. Then, in the next place, when these kings are reigning and beginning to set their affairs in order and advance their ten kingdoms, let them learn to acknowledge that he who shall come claiming the kingdom for himself and shall terrify those sons of men of whom we have been speaking, having a name containing the aforesaid number 666, is truly the abomination of desolation, unquote. There you have another term for the papacy, abomination of desolation, the abomination that makes desolate. Okay, And he also mentions that his name will be the number 666. Now, anybody knows that Vicar of Christ, if you take those letters, the Roman numerals of which add up to 666, Vicar of Christ in Roman is Vicarious Filii Dei. Vicarious Filii Dei. And if you add up the Roman numeral equivalents for all the letters in that title, Vicarious Filii Dei, they equal 666. There's no doubt about it. It's the papacy. And I would take the time, but we don't have the time, but there are many of the, the titles of the Pope, and he has many titles. They all equal 666. It's beyond the realm of possibility that this could be coincidence. All right. Now, Tertullian's apology thus describes the habit of the Christian church of the second century to pray for the security of the pagan Roman Empire in the knowledge that its downfall would bring the catastrophe of the reign of Antichrist and the ruin of the world. Did you know that the early Christians, the post-apostolic Christians, were praying for the security and the longevity of the Caesars? because they all believed that the Caesars were the restrainer of Antichrist, that as soon as the Caesars were taken out of the way, and they would be taken out of the way, that man of sin, the son of perdition, would be revealed. And a worse horror than the pagan Caesars, who burned Christians at the stake, fed them to lions in order to make, make mockery of the prophecies of Daniel, who tortured and tormented the Christians, would be replaced by an even worse catastrophe, the man of sin, the little horn, the son of perdition, 
the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the Pope of Rome, the abomination that makes desolate. desolate. Did you know the early Christians prayed for the longevity of the pagan Roman Empire so they wouldn't have to suffer under Antichrist, the Pope of Rome? Continuing, he says, addressing, quote, the rulers of the Roman Empire, unquote, he says, quote, we offer prayer for the safety of our princes to the eternal, the true, and the living God, whose favor beyond all others they must themselves desire. Thither we lift our eyes and hands outstretched because free from sin, with head uncovered, for we have nothing whereof to be ashamed. Finally, without a monitor, because it is from the heart we suffocate, and without ceasing for all our emperors, we offer prayer. We pray for their prolonged life, for security to the empire. With our hands thus stretched out and up to God, rend us with your iron claws, hang us up on crosses, wrap us in flames, Take our heads from us with the sword. Let loose the wild beasts upon us. The very attitude of a Christian praying is the preparation for all punishment. Let this, good rulers, be your work. Ring them from us, uh, ring from us the soul. Beseech God on the emperor's behalf. Did you hear what they say? They literally say, kill us. Crucify us, feed us to lions, do whatever you want to do. We still pray for the longevity and the security of the pagan Roman Caesars because an even worse calamity is about to befall God's people as soon as the pagan Roman Caesars are taken out of the way. That man of sin will be revealed, who will wear out the saints, who will blaspheme against God, who will rule the kings of the earth and persecute God's people more than any in history. Now listen, this should erase all doubt in your mind. What we've just covered in this note, this lengthy note by Henry Grattan Guinness, in some of the earliest Christian works, should convince you beyond any doubt who Paul was speaking of who Daniel was speaking of, who John was speaking of, and who Christ spoke of, but the Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. Now, for the first time in your life, the Bible, prophecy, and history all make sense. And now, you can look at what they're teaching in the ecumenical evangelic belly churches, the futurism, that is so, that has now become orthodox in the churches is laughable. If it were not so shameful, it would be laughable. He said, "Let this, good rulers, be your work. Ring from us the soul, beseeching God on the emperor's behalf." Christians praying for the pagan Roman Caesars that they would have life and longevity because they were restraining the rise of Antichrist. It says, upon the truth of God and devotion to his name, put the brand of crime. There is also another and a greater necessity for our offering prayer on behalf of the emperors, nay, for the complete stability of the empire and for Roman interests in general. For we know that a mighty shock impending over the whole world, in fact, the very end of all things, threatening dreadful woes, is only retarded, only restrained by the continued existence of the Roman Empire. We have no desire, then, to be overtaken by these dire events, and in praying for their coming may be delayed. We are lending our aid to Rome's duration, unquote. That's from the Apology, subsections 30 through 32. Jerome, another one of the early church fathers, writes to the same effect 
in his commentary on 2 Thessalonians 2, quote, he who now letteth or hindereth, it was the Roman Caesars. No futurism in that, is there? Only historicism. Now, continuing with the text, what then was the view of the early church? Look at the words of Tertullian. Quoting Second Thessalonians, he says, quote, Now ye know what detaineth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. What does that mean? It's Roman. It's the fourth and final empire. We are witnessing the pagan Roman empire. And so the mystery of iniquity that would culminate in the papacy is already at work. It's the pagan Roman empire. Okay? So this, 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 this restrainer, when he's taken out of the way, whoever replaces him is going to be worse in corruption, worse in sin, worse in crime. The mystery of iniquity doth already work in the Caesars. It's going to be a continuation of the Caesars, only under the name of Christianity. He says further, only he who now hinders must hinder until he be taken out of the way. What obstacle is there but the Roman state, the falling away of which, by being scattered into ten kingdoms, shall introduce Antichrist, that the beast Antichrist, with his false prophet, may wage war on the church of God. That's from Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, one that we are supposed to believe, according to Rome, was a futurist. No such thing. He was a historicist, as were all of God's people. Now, in his magnificent apology, addressed to the ruler, Okay, in his magnificent work entitled Apology, addressed to the rulers of the Roman Empire, Tertullian says that the Christian church, not himself, Mark, but the Christian church, prayed for the emperors and for the stability of the empire, the empire of Rome because they knew, quote, that a mighty shock impending over the whole earth In fact, the very end of all things, threatening dreadful woes, was only retarded, was only restrained, was only let by the continued existence of the Roman Empire, the pagan Roman Empire led by the Caesars. That's from his Apology, subsection 32. Where is the futurism in that? There isn't any. Read the words of Chrysostom in his commentary on 2 Thessalonians. Quote, One may first naturally inquire, what is that which withholdeth? And after that would know why Paul expresses this so obscurely. Quote, He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Unquote. That is, when the Roman Empire is taken out of the way, then he shall come. And naturally, for as long as the fear of this empire lasts, no one will readily exalt himself. But when that is dissolved, when the empire is dissolved, when the Caesars are taken out of the way, he will attack the anarchy and devour to seize upon the government both of men and of God. For as the kingdoms before this were destroyed, that of the Medes by the Babylonians, that of the Babylonians by the Persians, that of the Persians by the Macedonians or the Greeks, that of the Greeks by the Romans, so will this be by Antichrist and he by Christ. So there's your historicism laid out for you right then and there. Babylonians, Medo-Persians, Grecians, Romans, then the Antichrist, then Christ. No futurism in that, is there? 
Then accounting for Paul's reserve in alluding to this point, he adds, quote, because he says this of the Roman Empire, he naturally only glanced at it and spoke covertly, secretly, for he did not wish to bring upon himself superfluous enmities and useless dangers. In other words, he, he told the Thessalonians to their face that whoever, whoever replaced the Caesars would be Antichrist, that the Caesars would indeed be taken out of the way, and then the Antichrist would stand up. He dare not say that publicly. So when he wrote his book to the Thessalonians, he spoke in covert terms so that if the book ever fell into Roman hands, it would not provoke retaliation against Paul or the Thessalonians or any of the Christians for claiming that the Caesars would be taken out of the way. The Roman Empire would fall, and then it would be replaced by the so-called Holy Roman Empire under the popes. See how much the early church fathers knew? Even the Thessalonians during the time of Paul, they knew information that is totally, almost totally absent in our generation. We've been told lie after lie after lie. We believe in fables. We don't believe the truth. We have to return to this historical understanding of the prophecies. We have to restore the, his, the traditional belief of Paul and the, and the Thessalonians and all early Christians that it is the papacy that is the man of sin, the little horn, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the abomination that makes desolate. And if we don't, then we will succumb to this ecumenical movement to return us to Rome. And uh, whether we do or not, Rome's going to have her way with us because Rome has empowered the United States of America over our government. And when and if the Pope's ready, he's going to call for the destruction of God's people, those who know the truth, who is the real Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. We are going to be enemy number one to this new world order. Now he continues, for if he had said that after a little while, the Roman Empire would be dissolved, they would now immediately have even overwhelmed him as a, a pestilential person and all the faithful as living and warring to this end, unquote. If Paul's letter had fallen into Romans' hands, Paul would have been destroyed and so would have all his people. So Paul spoke in clandestine terms when he wrote his book. But he did not speak in clandestine terms when he was speaking face-to-face -face with the Thessalonians. They knew better than anybody who the Antichrist would be. It would be whoever replaced the Caesars. That's what the early church fathers believed. That's Chrysostom in his homily four on Second Thessalonians. From Irenaeus, who lived close to the apostolic times down to Chrysostom and Jerome, the fathers taught that the power withholding the manifestation of the man of sin was the Roman Empire as governed by the Caesars. The early church fathers, therefore, belonged to the historic and not to the futurist school of interpretation. For futurists imagine that the hindrance to the manifestation of the man of sin is still in existence, though the Caesars have long since passed away. Now, we've run out of time. We would go to point six, but I don't want to overstay my welcome. I'm sure that by this information, especially information that is still extant, written by the early church fathers that you can research and read for yourself, where they admit to praying for the longevity of the Caesars because once they were taken out of the way, they knew the man of sin, the Antichrist would re be revealed, and God's people would suffer persecution such as was not to that time nor would ever be, and they were fearful. And right as history dictates, they were right in their fear. But we know the end of the story. 
that this Roman Caesar called the papacy will be destroyed by Christ at his return. So whether we live or we die, let us serve Christ in spirit and in truth, because he is our victory. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross, this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt, so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior, we're total loss.